Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Fei Yu. I'm a faculty member at the iSchool, and my research area is natural language processing. So this semester, I'm teaching the text mining course. Um, I'm happy that to see uh, Jeff was talking about text analysis. Um, there's a lot of examples I'm going to give, but also is derived from uh, natural language processing area. Um, so today, this topic is about metadata and trustworthy AI. Uh, this is actually a collaborative research with uh, Professor Jen Chen, who is an expert in metadata. Um, so, first of all, I would like to mention that the concept of trustworthiness is not started with AI. So, it's a, it's a long-standing concept for any kind of a computer system. However, because of the new possibilities given by the generative AI technology, there's suddenly a huge increase in public interest in AI. So for people in these research areas, they would feel that we've been doing this for such a long time, why suddenly there's like such a popularity. So this is a new thing, and we have to look at trustworthiness in the new lens, and also the increased uh, importance. So first of all, Okay, so I'm going to use the, the low tech. Yes, okay. So, um, so that is why we have this slide that we are uh, uh, at this turning point with AI, particularly about trustworthiness. And uh, there's a quote on um, trustworthy AI. It's like, we may be able to uh, build perfectly safe AI system, but how do we prevent that from, you know, somebody using it for evil purposes? So now, first, of all, let's look at the concept of uh, trustworthiness from several different perspectives. One is, what do the academic uh, researchers think about the concept of trustworthy AI? What does it encompass? And also, from the government perspective, the European Union, the US government, how do they view the trustworthiness? The regulation would be an important piece in that. So this is um, a paper published by Jeanette Green, a leading computer scientist, that she laid out uh, these principles for trustworthy AI. So I'm going to use uh, ChatGPT as an example to uh, describe those concepts. The first one is reliability. So basically, it means like does the, uh, the AI system does what you want it to do? Like, is it doing the right thing? Uh, for example, like if you ask ChatGPT to output um, citations, as Jeff mentioned, right? so it could be a real citation, it could be a made-up citation. Okay? So there's no guarantee that it is reliable. And the other one is safety. Does it do any harm? So have you heard of uh, the new story about ChatGPT, ChatGPT telling someone to go suicide? Right? So this is a potential harm. Um, and also security. So security is also not a new concept, but with the AI system, especially with increased importance and utility. So what if it is um, under attack? And how would that affect our uh, life and society? Um, privacy concerns. So everyone use chat GPT would be wondering, like, how will my data be used about a model? So OpenAI, I checked with their website, they claim that we will not use uh, user input through API uh, to training our model. However, have you heard of the memorization problem of large language models? So some people nodded, right? So that means large language models could memorize a long sequence of tokens. So, well, it depends on what it is, right? If it's a quote from Shakespeare, that's okay. But if it's your social security number somehow ended up in the training data, then that's a problem. So privacy is a concern for large language models. And then availability. So we, in the world, the world is not evenly distributed, and the models are not like a, um, available to everyone in the same way. So think about 
uh, ChatGPT is trained on popular languages like English, but there are also low resource languages in this world. And so some languages are spoken by a small number of people. And, the, and then it would be hard to train language models on that. So in the NLP world, there are studies that try to utilize the limited data from low resource language to make it available and useful. There's also money question. So if you have more money, you can pay this. GPT-4 is more expensive than ChatGPT. And I checked it with my limited uh, uh, test sample. I think GPT-4 a little less likely to output data uh, citations than ChatGPT. So you could pay more to get better data or better results, but there's a fairness and equity issues there. Right? And lastly, usability. Can a few men use it easily? Right? So there are people with different kinds of uh, uh, impairments, limitations, right? also with accessibility. So can everybody use these tools in an equally effective way? So that's another question. So these are the issues in the mind of computer scientists, like the leading researchers. So now let's see what people think about it in the, uh, by the government. So they only consider the legal concern, and the entire society cares about the ethical concern, and we all care about the robustness of the, the system. So now let's see. This is the seven guidelines from the European Union uh, commissions. So. And the next slide is going to show the elements uh, derived from the U.S. government. So here they mentioned about human agency and oversight. So this means that we want humans to be uh, able to control the AI systems rather than like a little run it on its own. Okay? So uh, human in command, a human in the loop. Okay? Uh, the other one is technical robustness and safety. The robustness here means that we want the system to be accurate, reliable, and reproducible. So how many of you encountered a reproducible problem when you use ChatGPT? So today you enter your prompt and you get a result. And tomorrow you enter the same prompt, the result could change. So I'm using ChatGPT to do some annotation for me and sometimes it's going to be wishy-washy on certain answers. So then there's the reproducibility question. Um, and the next uh, principle is about privacy data governance. Right? How do we um, manage the data and make sure that user privacy is protected in AI usage? And the last, uh, and the next one is transparency. So how do we know how the model uh, came to their decisions or the answers? Right? Especially when these models are used in critical environment, for example, hospitals. So if a model is used to help doctors to decide who should be treated next when there's a limited resource, it's a matter of life and death. Right? And if the model is opaque to the users, to the doctors, then there is a big question about uh, ethics. Right? Um, and then there's diversity, non-discrimination, and fairness. So you probably all have heard about bias in the models. So whatever bias inherited in the training data might be captured by the model and get re reflected. And so how do we detect them, correct them, is a big question. The next one is societal and environmental well-being. So this well-being involves humans' well-being. For example, OpenAI has been using um, the annotators around the world, especially in some developing countries, because of the low cost. Right. However, they probably have to annotate some uh, sensitive content that couldn't harm their health. Right? How, how are they taking care of that's a question. And also, building the AI models require a lot of computing power, that means electricity. So there's a huge sustainability question uh, when it comes to uh, AI modeling. The last one is accountability. So even though we say like AI made a decision, probably increasingly like integrity of two humanism in the system. However, who should be responsible for those decisions? Right? I think in the case of self-driving cars, like when there's some objects right, in a difficult situation, like there's a dog, there's a cat, there's a human being. So if you have to pick one, then who would you pick? Right? For a self-driving car. <coughs> so there will be a lot of questions about accountability and uh, there will be uh, some 
within the society, uh, ethical discussions, and also there's a legal So now let's look at in the United States. Actually, the U.S. government has a pretty similar view on those principles, even though they summarize it into five major uh, principles. So the first one is safe and effective use. So you could think of it as a safety, like do we have a fallback system uh, when the, the AI system is uh, is broken? Right? So do we have anything to fall back? And also, is it does no harm? Um, the second one, algorithm, algorithmic discrimination and protection. So you have heard of uh, like image recognition system cannot recognize some faces, right? Or better, uh, the performance is better for some population but worse for the population. The next one is data privacy again. Okay. Uh, Notice and explanation is mostly for the model's explainability, especially for critical decisions. So the user has the right to know how those AI uh, decisions made by AI, right, under what principle, and is it uh, reasonable or not. Um, one example is actually, I think, of, you know, Amazon is using algorithm to uh, decide on um, like the productivity of employees. Like, uh, they could determine promotion and, um, um, like, firing someone. So then there's a lot of uh, um, questions about how those decisions make. And last one, human maternity consideration of fallback. So I think uh, the effective safe system and the, and the fallback is sort of connect to each other, depending on how you define those uh, dimensions. But these two views, like from European Union and the US, they sort of basically and the academics share a lot in common with the three uh, different versions, right? So a lot of concepts, a group of concepts are shared in common. So now, I would like to have a quick poll for everyone in this room. So how do you feel about the trusted worthiness of AI and all these? So if you feel like very positive, really good hand, you're good, raise your hand. No, yeah, finally, I have one. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Um, and how about these people feel like uh, on the other end of the spectrum, like I'm very much worried. A third of this room? Yeah, a third in this room feel very much worried. So how about the rest? Like a, maybe you're kind of in between, but you're more on the positive side? Yeah? So how about you're kind of slightly toward the negative side, but not so like pessimistic? Mm. A few, but not a lot. Right? So probably like uh, people who are very positive or very worried are like, not, I think there are, there are quite some people who are very worried, probably one third in this room. But I see a lot of people who are on the positive side with a little reservation. So I guess I share this um, sentiment of um, this pocket. I think um, there are a lot of effort in terms of uh, developing trustworthy AI systems. However, identifying those problems is part of the solution. And reading those views could be, you know, sometimes you feel like I'm having a heart attack. So this is part of uh, our trajectory toward finding the solution. So now let's look at some uh, ideas about how to make AI trustworthy. So this is more of a framework that we can think of and apply all of the sort of views of all the solutions that we think of in this framework to so have a systematic view of that. So this is a diagram uh, proposed by Tadasi AI Risk Management uh, Framework. So basically it has four different components and that is a loop in terms of the AI development cycle. So on the top left, you can see this is the application context. So before you start to build an AI model, you need to think about its application context. And at this time, you can think about the accountability, data governance, privacy issues, uh, transparency, etc. It is important to actually think about all of these trustworthiness questions even before you start to build uh, the model. And then the next step is, okay, so we decided on what we want to work on, and then we need our data. 
So in the data part, data and import part, we have a lot of data quality questions. There's garbage in, garbage out. So in the data stage, how do we manage uh, data quality, privacy concerns, uh, et cetera? And with the data, we can move on to the third stage, that is to build the AI models. So when we build the AI models, we want to make it feasible, verifiable, and fair. So I'm going to talk a bit more about what that means. And after you build the model, we're ready to deploy it in the field. So this is also the time to check its safety, the use scenario. We probably want to run some user study to make sure that it is also easy to use and it's available. And also, what are the alternatives? Right? The fallback. So those are the key trustworthiness concepts gets um, attention in different stages of AI uh, modeling projects. So let's look a little bit further into the first part. This is the application context. So we want to adapt, adopt a human subject approach. For example, you have all heard of the human in the loop. So you want to have human involvement in preparing uh, when you when you develop the system and also when you train and test uh, these models. And also, um, what are the legal restrictions <laughs> for um, developing the model? So in the case of uh, ChatGPT and also Google's uh, BARD, they actually put uh, a lot of guardrails in the, in, in, the, in the design, and they use the human uh, prompts to train these models. So sometimes you would encounter the situation where the model would refuse to answer your question. And you also see that like, some people are trying to uh, jailbreak. So those are the things that what the company has concerns about what the user wants to know or what users have concerns. So these should be prepared when you start to build an AI system. Um, and also, I would like to emphasize this concept of respect of human autonomy. So how often do you feel like you're manipulated by an algorithm? Yes, can you give an example, like when do you feel that way? I don't know, like you're shopping at Amazon and you went there to buy something, you ended up buying more than you wanted to, just because they showed it to you. Mm -hmm. You weren't thinking about it, so that's manipulation. Yeah, recommend your system. Right? I mean, I, I like both products, but I didn't set out to buy both, right? Yeah. So, so there are all kinds of recommender system on social media, on news websites, shopping website. They're trying to give you influence. And the thing is, how much, how many choices do you have to like turn it on? So those are the those are the choices. Uh, one um, project that I did was actually detecting health advice from research papers. And my goal was to uh, help uh, average people like me, even though. Um, I don't have a lot of medical knowledge. I want to know what people are saying about like a, a particular treatment. I want to know a little uh, bit more about that. But uh, when we publish the paper, actually now the research community has this ethical review. So they want to see if your um, project or any potential product would have any potential harm. So you have to think ahead. So I actually did not think that much. I thought these are all research papers. It's publicly available. What harm could it make? But that review actually helped me a lot to understand there are things I never thought about. For example, some of those might be outdated because they're from old papers. Now, like after 20 years, we have much better understanding of a disease or a drug or a certain treatment. So those have to be updated. But when you just retrieve advice from individual papers, lay people like me would not be able to understand which one is up to date and which is not. Right? So how do you give user the ability to differentiate them or give them a warning that you, you should not just use these advice immediately to your, your health condition. You have to consult with the doctor on those. So those have to be considered. And also like uh, allow the author of those papers to take the advice out of uh, your system if they think they would say, yeah, I think mine is outdated. You should take it off. So do you give them the option to do that. So it's part of the design of the system, not particularly for the model itself, but it's like in its own ecosystem. 
So I think uh, um, the training from uh, the data science perspective is actually push our students to think more about these application contexts before you even start to develop, for example, the course project. Okay, and then the next uh, uh, important piece in the cycle is the data quality. So when you gather data, we're building the AI models. There are a lot of uh, data quality concerns. And one thing is that actually um, the quality of the model is largely dependent on the quality of your data. So in this case, uh, if you have uh, messy is the data, uh, if you're trained on uh, identifying birds, it will be by a helicopter instead. And there's some systematic study to show that if you train a model on uh, whereas the high quality data, the performance of the model is way better. Um, so here I'd like to give a quick example like about sentiment analysis, because many of you do that in your course project, right? So you probably want to ask the question like how the training data is obtained. And so who will give a label for this is positive, this is negative? So you can check actually the, the data description to see how they were obtained. Some of them were obtained by Amazon Mechanical Turco. We just ask people to do that. Um, and then, but people have different opinions on the sentiment. So some are like a more, a very neutral. They could, uh, some are saying, okay, I level of positivity or negativity. Um, and sometimes they just use convenient labels like emojis. So this is a treat. I saw a happy face and then positive, right? So what about sarcasm, et cetera? So there are actually a lot of the data quality questions in each uh, of those uh, models. And you, my recommendation is not to take the data at the face value. You want to read the data description. So this is the metadata for the data. Okay? So you want to know the pre-life before uh, you use this model, these data sets. So the next step is to uh, build the model. And when we build the model, there are actually a lot of details probably not known to the users. I mean, for example, like um, um, the parameters, because now like uh, the mega models each have, they could have like millions of parameters to tune from. And then when you develop uh, the model also, like the connection between the data, like how the data was input and used, um, how the algorithms are trained, so now in the uh, machine learning community, there's a push to uh, build, like we call it a scorecard or some uh, data description, particularly for the model. So the model descriptors. Okay? So each model has an ID. Okay? So it talks about your, your data, uh, where it's tested, uh, how is it trained, so that these uh, information are transparent to the outside, uh, particularly to the downstream application. And lastly, when we deploy the system to uh, the field, we want to make sure that it is safe and also uh, there is alternative when a system breaks down. So these are the, the last pieces for the um, uh, ensuring the trustworthy AI. So going back to the connection between trustworthy AI and metadata, so mostly it's, it's about the two pieces. One is the data, one is the model. With metadata, the goal is to uh, develop principles and practices so that we can document everything that's important about the data and also the model so that these information can be used for uh, evaluating and developing trustworthy AI system. So, um, so a lot of frameworks are being for example, how do we document the AI models? How do we document the quality of uh, data? And actually, a lot of times, those are very difficult uh, tasks. There's so many models there, um, and also data are coming from all kinds of variety. And how do you describe them is actually a question of how do you consolidate and extract the key project. And also, you don't want those uh, scorecards for either data or models to be too long. Because then um, modelers or like the, the data analysts, they wouldn't have the time to record everything. Then it, when you ask people to do too much, you know what's going to happen? Just, um, let's ignore it. Right? 
So uh, how do you balance the, the workload and also the, the usefulness is uh, an ongoing question and it is real. Um, I think that's it for this topic. I hope that I could understand this topic a bit more. Any questions? Uh, someone online asked, corporations have uh, repeatedly violated regulations protecting privacy and it's proven it's proven difficult to get the visibility necessary to judge compliance. Even if even if good laws and regulations are established, why should citizens and consumers believe they would be effectively enforced? Effectively what? Enforced. Yeah, I think that's a Great question, and also a question I cannot answer because um, I'm not a legal expert, but I share that concern because uh, in May 2023, there's a congressional hearing. I don't know if anyone attended, watched the video. It's the uh, Open AI CEO, uh, Sam Altman, testified at the conference. And my takeaway from that hearing was actually concerning because the concern is that. The industry actually came forward to the legislators saying that you need to regulate this industry. Right? But on the other hand, the senators actually are asking the industry the question like, we didn't do a good job regulating social media. We don't really know how to regulate AI. So they are trying to learn more about AI to be able to know what kind of regulations is feasible or reasonable. So there are a lot of open questions there. But I think for us, it's like if we have more people working on those problems, they will be improved. So it's just like a believing effort right now. Yeah, uh, that uh, concern of open AI and regulation. Yeah. I think there is also a lobby labor there because if you are the leader in a market, you want regulation to stop other to compete against you. So I think we cannot take everything he say as a part value. Because in fact, what he wants is the best for his company. That is protection for regulation from regulation. Yes, I agree. I think that we have to gather like voices from all um, aspects, from all like uh, groups in the society, not just the industry, not just the academia, but from like nonprofit organizations, particularly grassroots organizations, individuals, to have this. Um, uh, discourse and discussion on these uh, topics. I think those are those are important. I have another question. And um, we think that there is a problem with replicability with generative AI. But if we set a seed for uh, the model, so then we get the same answer every time. Because I think, for instance, in ChatGPT, we do not have the ability to set a seed. But that could be possible. So you're asking about the liquid juice of the Yeah, we said they seed for the random number generation that mm -hmm. is the same every time. In that case, we would have the same answer every time. I see. Yeah, so you're asking a question that for some uh, AI models, for example, if you use traditional machine learning uh, methods, you develop a linear quantifier, uh, you will get the same result every time you run a test, right? But for generative AI, it's a probability-based model, and at the same time, there are just so many parameters. So any when you retrain it, the, the result will change. And also, it's a auto, particularly for GPT, it's auto regressive. It predicts the next uh, probable uh, token. Okay, so that adds the instability of uh, the model. I think that is um, a concern that you will not always get the same answer. And now, especially when you Give the different prompts that the prompt will affect its output. Right? So right now, this is in my text mining course. I'm adding new content about prompt engineering strategies. But I have to tell my student that actually uh, my lecture title is uh, "Prompt Engineering Science or Alchemy." Because I cannot say that these are all like the proven knowledge already. This is just people are trying to understand. They have. Uh, done all kinds of tests, we're trying to understand what's going on uh, in these AI models. So we basically are uh, trying to do some tests on these models on certain tasks. And the more tasks that they run, the, the more understanding we have. For example, a lot of the uh, tasks are all about reasoning. 
Okay, so so especially when we're moving from narrow AI to strong AI, we want AI to behave like a human, think like a human, then how do we know they're doing the right reasoning? So when they solve a math problem, are they running like you're going through the steps correctly? Right? And also um there recently there's a, a, a new paper talking about uh, AI uh Chat GPT's inability to uh, do some kind of a knowledge inference. For example, we call it um, uh, inverse uh, retrieval. So if the model can answer the question, like, uh, uh, who's Elon Musk's, Elon Musk's mom, right? So they got it right. But so if you know A and B is a relationship with a parent and child, you should be able to retrieve it in both ways. But if you ask Chat GPT the reverse question, like, I don't know who's Elon Musk's mom, but let's say, uh, who's A's son? And then it failed to answer the question. So basically, it means it did not have the knowledge of these two persons' actual relationship. They just kind of spit out whatever in the training data that typically a famous person is mentioned, and then after followed by the relative name. So, so these kind of inquiries, uh, the more we do it, and in more systematic way, we'll be able to tell the limitations uh, in the uh, reasoning process, and then we start to figure out how do we improve. Uh, you are talking about the large language model. There is a limitation. Uh, uh, not everyone is speaking English. So I'm thinking if you embedded a translator in front of the model, every time you enter any language and you translate first, and then you use the model to answer and translate back, that will solve the problem. Uh, that right. Um, you are talking about a Python approach. So let's do divide and conquer. Uh, for no resource the uh, uh, language. I think the question is the machine translation system is also trained on similar architecture and similar data. So we probably so if there's a limitation to low resource language by dividing into two steps it may not give you a lot of uh, boost. But I think it now there's um at first trying to understand like what are shared knowledge between different languages. Every language has its uh, um, grammatical structure and things, and some of them are common. And so if you can copy that and then transfer whatever knowledge you learning from one language to another language, that could be a boost. Yeah. Yeah. We're out of time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you.